Mr. McCoy back with The Borrowers Part 8. As you recall, Arietti had just written a letter to her Uncle Hendreary. But it was one thing to write a letter, and quite another to find some means of getting it under the mat. Pod, for several days, could not be persuaded to go borrowing. He was well on, he was well away on his yearly turnout of the storerooms, mending partitions and putting up new shelves. Arietti usually enjoyed the spring sorting when half-forgotten treasures came to light and new uses were discovered for old borrowings. She used to love turning over the scraps of silk or lace, the odd kid gloves, the pencil stubs, the, ra the rusty razor blades, the hairpins and the needles, the dried figs, the hazelnuts, the powdery bits of chocolate, and the scarlet stubs of sealing wax. Pod, one year, had made her a hairbrush from a toothbrush, and Homily had made her a pair of Turkish bloomers from two glove fingers for knocking about in the mornings. There were spools and spools of colored silks and cottons and small variegated balls of odd wool, pinpoints which Homily used to flower scoops and bottle tops galore. But this year, Arietti banged about impatiently and stole away whenever she dared to stare through the, the grating, hoping to see the boy. She now kept the letter always with her, stuffed inside her jersey, and the edges became rubbed. Once he did run past the grating and she saw his woolen stockings, he was making a chugging noise in his throat like some kind of engine, and as he turned the corner to let out a piercing, whoo, whoo, it was a train whistle, he told her afterwards, so he did not hear her call. One evening after dark, she crept away and tried to open the first gate, but swing and tug as she might, she could not budge the pen. Homily, every time she swept the sitting room, would grumble about the carpet. It may be a curtain and chair job, she would say to Pod, but it wouldn't take you not a quarter of an hour with your pen and name tape to fetch me a bit of blotting paper from the desk in the morning room. Anyone would think, looking at this floor, that we lived in a toad hole. No one could call me house proud, said Homily. You couldn't be, not with my kind of family, but I do like, she said, to keep nice things nice. And at last, on the fourth day, Pod gave in. He laid down his hammer, a small electric bell clapper, and said to Arietti, come along. Arietti was glad to see the morning room. The door luckily had been left ajar and it was fascinating to stand at last in the thick pile of the carpet gazing upward at the shelves and pillars and towering gables of the famous overmantel. So that's where they had lived, she thought, those pleasure-loving creatures, remote and happy and self-sufficient. She imagined the overmantel women, a little tweedy, Homily had described them with wasp waists and piled Edwardian hair, swinging carelessly outward on the pilasters, lissom and laughing, gazing at themselves in the inset looking glass, which reflected back the tobacco jars, the cut glass decanters, the bookshelves, and the plush covered table. She imagined the overmantel men, fair they were said to be, with long mustaches and nervous slender hands smoking and drinking and telling their witty tales, so they had never asked Homily up there. Poor Homily, with their bony nose and never tidy hair, they would have looked at her strangely, Arietti thought, with their long, half-laughing eyes, and smiled a little, and humming, turning away, and they had lived only on breakfast food, on toast and egg and tiny snips of mushroom, sausage they'd have had, and crispy bacon and little sips of tea and coffee, are they now? Arietti wondered. Where could such creatures go? Pod had flung his pen so it stuck into the seat of the chair and was up the leg in a trice, leaning outward on his tape. Then, pulling out the pen, he flung it like a haviland above his head into a fold of curtain. This was the moment, Arietti thought, and felt for her precious letter. She slipped into the hall. It was darker this time front door closed and she ran across it with a beating heart. The mat was heavy, but she lifted up the corner and slid the letter under by pushing with her foot. There, she said, and looked about her. Shadows, shadows, and a ticking clock. 
She looked across the great plain of floor to where in the distance the stairs mounted. Another world above, she thought, world on world, and shivered slightly. What do you think Arietti's going to do now? Share with your fellow listener. Arietti, called Pod softly from the morning room, and she ran back in time to see him swing clear of the chair seat and pull himself upward on the name tape level with the desk. Lightly, he came down feet apart, and she saw him, for safety's sake, twist the name tape lightly round his waist. I wanted you to see that, he said a little breathless. Blotting paper, when he pushed it, floated down quite softly, riding lightly on the air, and lay at last some feet beyond the desk, pink and fresh on the carpet's dingy pile. You start rolling, whispered Pop. I'll be down. And Arietti went on her knees and began to roll the blotting paper until it grew too stiff for her to hold. Pod soon finished it off and lashed it with his name tape, through which he ran his hat pen, and together they carried the long cylinder, as two house painters would carry a ladder, under the clock and down the hole. Homily hardly thanked them when, panting a little, they dropped the bundle in the passage outside the sitting room door. She looked alarmed. Oh, there you are, she said. Thank goodness. That boy's about again. I've just heard Mrs. Driver talking to Crampfurl. Oh, cried Arietti. What did she say? Homily glanced sharply at her and saw that she looked pale. Arietti realized she should have said, What boy? But it was too late now. Nothing real bad. Homily went on, as though to reassure her. It's just a boy they have upstairs. It's nothing at all, but I heard Mrs. Driver say that she'd take a slipper to him. See if she wouldn't, if uh, he had the mats up once again in the hall. The mats in the hall? echoed Arietti. Yes, three days running, she said to, she said to Crampferl. He'd had the mats up in the hall. She could tell, she said, by the dust and the way he'd put them back. It was the hall part that worried me, seeing as you and your father. What's the matter, Arietti? There's no call for that sort of face. Come on now, help me move the furniture, and we'll get down the carpet. Oh dear, oh dear, thought Arietti miserably, as she helped her mother empty the matchbox chest of drawers. Three days running, he's looked and nothing there. He'll give up hope now. He'll never look again. Do you agree with Arietti that the boy's not going to look for the letter now? Share what you think with your fellow listener. That evening, she stood for hours on a stool under the chute in their kitchen, pretending she was practicing to get a feeling, when really she was listening to Mrs. Driver's conversations with Cramp Furl. All she learned was that Mrs. Driver's feet were killing her, and that it was a pity that she hadn't given her notice last May, and would Crantfurl have another drop, considering there was no more in the cellar than anyone would drink in her lifetime, and if they thought she was going to clean the first floor window single-handed, they had better think again. But on the third night, just as Arietti had climbed down off the stool before she overbalanced with weariness, she heard Crantfurl say, if you asked me, I'd say he had a ferret. And quickly, Arietti climbed back again, holding her breath. A ferret? She heard Mrs. Driver exclaim shrilly. Whatever next, where would he keep it? That I wouldn't like to say, said Crampfurl in his rumbly, earthy voice. All I know is he was up beyond Parkins Beck, going round all the banks and calling like down all the rabbit holes. Well, I never, said Mrs. Driver. Where's your glass? Just a drop, said Crampfurl. That's enough. Goes to your liver, the sweet stuff. Not like beer, it isn't. Yes, he went on. When he saw me coming with a gun, he pretended to be cutting a stick like from the hedge. But I'd seed him all right and heard him, calling away his nose down a rabbit hole. 
It's my belief he's got a ferret. There was a gulp, as though Cramphor was drinking. Yes, he said at last, and Ariadne heard him set the glass down. A ferret called Uncle Something. Ariadne made a sharp movement, balancing for one moment with arms waving and fell off the stool. There was a clatter as the stool slid sideways, banged against a chest of drawers, and rolled over. What was that? asked Cramphurl. There was a silence upstairs, and Ariadne held her breath. I didn't hear nothing, said Mrs. Driver. Yes, said Cramphurl. It was under the floor light, there by the stove. That's nothing, said Mrs. Driver. It's the coals falling. Often sounds like that. Scares you sometimes when you're sitting here alone. Here, pass your glass. There's only a drop left. Might as well finish the bottle. They're drinking fine old Madeira, thought Arietti, and very carefully she set the stool upright and stood quietly beside it, looking up. She could see through the light occasionally flicked with shadow as one person or another moved a hand or arm. Yes, went on Cramphurl, returning to his story, and when I come up with me gun, he says, all innocent-like to put me off, I shouldn't wonder. Any old badger sets round here? Artful, said Mrs. Driver. The things they think of, badger sets. And she gave her creaking laugh. As a matter of fact, said Cramphurl, there did used to be one, but when I showed him where it was, he didn't take no notice of it. Just stood there waiting for me to go. Cramp Pearl laughed. Two can play at that game, I thought, so I just sits myself down, and there were the two of us. And what happened? Well, he had to go off he had to go off in the end, leaving his ferret. I waited a bit, but it never came out. I poked around a bit and whistled. Pity I never heard properly what he called it. Uncle something, it sounded like. Arietti heard a sudden scrape of a chair. Well, said Cramphurl, I'd better get on now and shut up the chickens. The scullery door banged and there was a sudden clatter overhead as Mrs. Driver began to rake the stove. Arietti replaced the stool and stole softly into the sitting room where she found her mother alone. So do you think Arietti was glad to hear what Cramphurl and Mrs. Driver were talking about, or was she distressed by this information? Share what you think with your fellow listener. And now a little more for now of the borrowers. Homily was ironing, bending and banging and pushing the hair back out of her eyes, all round the room, underclothes hung airing on safety pins, which Homily used like clothes hangers, coat hangers. What happened? asked Homily. Did you fall over? Yes, said Arietti, moving quietly into her place beside the fire. How's the feeling coming? Oh, I don't know, said Arietti. She clasped her knees and laid her chin on them. Where's your knitting? asked Homily. I don't know what's come over you lately, always idle. You don't feel seedy, do you? Oh, exclaimed Ariadne, let me be. And Homily for once was silent. It's the spring, she told herself. Used to take me like that sometimes, at her age. I must see that boy, Ariadne was thinking, staring blindly into the fire. I must hear what happened. I must hear if they're all right. I don't want us to die out. I don't want to be the last borrower. I don't want... And here, Arietti dropped her face onto her knees to live forever and ever like this, in the dark, under the floor. No good getting supper, said Homily, breaking the silence. Your father's gone borrowing to her room, and you know what that means. Arietti raised her head. No, she said, hardly listening. What does it mean? That he won't be back, said Homily sharply, for a good hour and a half. He likes it up there, gossiping with her and poking about on the dressing table. And it's safe enough once that boy's in bed. Not that there's anything we want special, she went on. It's just these new shelves he's made. They look kind of bare, he says. And he might, he says, just pick up a little something. Arietti suddenly was sitting bolt upright thought had struck her 
leaving her breathless and a little shaky at the knees. A good hour and a half, her mother had said, and the gates would be open. Where are you going? asked Tommy as Arietti moved toward the door. Just along to the storerooms, said Arietti, shading with one hand her candle dip from the drop. I won't be long. Now don't you untidy anything, Homily called out after her, and be careful of that light. As Arietti went down the passage, she thought, It is true. I am going to the storerooms to find another hat pin. And if I do find a hat pin and a piece of string, there won't be any name tape, I still won't be long because I'll have to get back before Papa. And I'm going, I'm doing it for their sakes, she told herself doggedly. And one day they'll thank me. All the same, she felt a little guilty. guilty. Artful, that's what Mrs. Driver would say she was. There was a hat pin one with the bar for a top, and she tied on a piece of string very firmly, twisting it back and forth like a figure of eight, and as a crowning inspiration, she sealed it with sealing wax. The gates were open, and she left the candle in the middle of the passage where it could come to no harm, just below the hall by the clock. The great hall, when she had climbed out into it, was dim with shadows. A single gas jet turned low, made a pool of light beside the locked front door, and another faintly flickered on the landing halfway up the stairs. The ceiling sprang away into height and darkness all around was space. The night nursery she knew was at the end of the upstairs passage, and the boy would be in bed. Her mother had just said so. Arietti had watched her father use his pen on the chair, and single stairs in comparison were easier was a kind of rhythm to it after a while. A throw, a pull, a scramble, and an upward swing. The stair rods glinted coldly, but the pile of the carpet seemed soft and warm and delicious to fall back on. On the half landing, she paused to get her breath. She did not mind the semi-darkness. She lived in darkness. She was at home in it, and at a time like this, it made her feel safe. On the upper landing, she saw an open door and a great square of golden light which, which like a barrier lay across the passage. I've got to pass through that, Arietti told herself, trying to be brave. Inside the lighted room, a voice was talking, droning on. We'll find out what happens to Arietti, Pod, and Homily as the borrowers continues.